Newtown, Connecticut. Orlando, Florida. Tucson, Arizona. Aurora, Colorado. San Bernardino, California. Charleston, South Carolina. There's a reason these cities are so familiar to us, a reason many of you will recognize these names. Most people know these cities not for their landmarks or for their population sizes, but for the tragic events that have taken place here. The shootings in movie theaters, schools, nightclubs. These have all happened within the last few years, and these events stand out in our minds for the tragedy and shock that we felt as a nation. These six events ruled the news for weeks after they happened. You couldn't turn on the TV or radio without hearing new developments in the story. Yes, we know these six cities, but what about the rest? These are all the mass shootings that have taken place in our nation between 2009 and 2015. 133 events of the same nature as those six that we are so familiar with. So why do we not know about these? In my freshman year here at Michigan State, I joined the first year of a promising new program called the Social Science Scholars. Thanks to this incredible program, I've had many opportunities as an undergrad that before I was able to only dream of. One of those was pairing with Dr. April Zioli, a professor in the School of Criminal Justice, to do research in my first year. Our research focused on the newsworthiness of mass shootings. In other words, what factors impact the coverage of a mass shooting? Why are some widely reported on while others are not? First of all, it's important to understand how we conducted this research. We defined mass shooting as the FBI defines it, a single event carried out by a person or group of people armed with firearms, which results in the death of four more victims. This is important because you may see articles on the web every now and then that proclaim 400 mass shootings in 2016, and they're not wrong per se, but you do have to look at how those articles define a mass shooting. Often, they will say an event constitutes a mass shooting if four or more victims are injured, not killed. While not technically incorrect, this distinction does tend to widen the net considerably. We measured newsworthiness in two ways, number of stories and word count in those stories. We looked only at broadcasts from major national news networks, and when we had all our numbers, we looked at correlations, significance, bivariate regressions, multivariate regressions, all those fun statistics. But if you're like me and math isn't your forte, don't worry. I'll explain the results and the connections we found. So, on that note, what makes a mass shooting newsworthy? First of all, the old adage of if it bleeds, it leads is truer than ever. We found that both word count and story count increased for each additional death or injury in a shooting. In the end, the number of fatalities proved the most significant factor out of all of the ones we looked at. So as deaths go up, word count and story count increase steeply. Also, if it took place in public, it was more likely to be reported on. A public setting would look something like a movie theater or school. Now, these factors make sense when looking at the shootings we all know so well. High victim counts, both in deaths and injuries, and public settings, such as churches or nightclubs. But what are we missing here? What shootings aren't deemed worthy of media attention, and why not? First of all, we found a couple of factors that didn't make any difference at all. One of those factors was if the shooter obtained the firearm illegally, and the other was if the shooter committed suicide after the crime. But more importantly, we found two factors that made a shooting less likely to be reported on. One was if it happened in a private setting, and the other, is what we call IPH, 
or intimate partner homicide. This is when a spouse, girlfriend, boyfriend, partner, ex, or anyone else intimately involved with the shooter is one of the victims. Oftentimes, this includes killing other family members, and most often, the others killed in the shooting are the children in the relationship. When a shooting included IPH or took place in the home, it was far less likely to be reported on as much or at all. According to Every Town for Gun Safety, 57% of gun violence victims are intimate partners or family members. The majority of people affected are close to the shooter emotionally. The media portrays mass shootings as a stranger killing other strangers, when in reality, that's the minority of cases. Our own study found that over 60% of the mass shootings that we examined were never reported on at all. The majority of these included intimate partner homicide. When looking at our other results on how intimate partner homicide in a shooting means that it will probably not be reported on, the research suggests that IPH is less interesting to the public or not seen as news. This may be because IPH is less relatable. No one wants to believe their partner is capable of such a thing, so people would rather read about the random deaths of innocents. Some may even say that the intimate partners of the shooters were complicit in their fate, that they should have taken more countermeasures or shouldn't have been involved with the shooter in the first place. So what's the point here? How does this impact our lives? The media disproportionately reports on certain types of mass shootings. Not only do we know this simply by looking at the map of the 133 recent mass shootings, but also by looking at the numbers, such as the results from our research. For example, even though most mass shootings take place in private, the vast majority of shootings we hear about on the news take place in public. Even though most mass shootings include intimate partner homicide, those are very rarely discussed in the media. And although we all know the horrific shooting that took place at Sandy Hook Elementary, we don't usually hear about the kids harmed in their own homes, which often happens in cases of intimate partner homicide. The media is misrepresenting these shootings and our perception is altered because of it. We fear getting shot by a stranger in a movie theater or school or church. In reality, we should statistically be fearing the guns in our own homes handled by our family and our partners. After 9-11, the frequency of car accidents in the US skyrocketed. More people were on the roads because no one wanted to fly, even though such an attack was hugely unlikely to happen again. Why is this? The answer is simple. Our perceptions of risk are based on what we see. And if we see a stranger shooting at strangers in a public place when we turn on the TV, that's what we're going to see as most likely to happen to us. When looking at mass shootings and many other things in our world, no one piece can give us the whole story. Adam Lanza, the man responsible for Sandy Hook, is not representative of all shooters, and Pulse Nightclub is not representative of all mass shootings. These are complex people and events. Each deserves to be looked at in depth, yet at the same time, we have to look at the big picture. How do all 133 of these events fit together? What are the patterns? and how can we change them? We must take care that our perceptions are not altered irreparably. Never look at something and see one picture, challenge it. These things don't happen in a vacuum. There is always context, and it's our responsibility to see that context. Even two sides to every story is oversimplifying. Every piece of every mosaic is multifaceted when we look closely. We must think critically about these statistics. So few people are informed on these facts, and if we all had better numbers and not just what we see on the news, we would be able to focus more intelligently on solving the violence problems we face. We talk about stopping another Newtown, another Orlando, 
another Aurora. But what about another Indianapolis, or another Tyrone, another Wichita, Douglasville, Morgantown, Springfield, one of the 133 others? We must stop focusing on only a few of the pieces and see the big picture. Failure to think critically about any given topic will result in standing still. In this case especially, that is one thing that we cannot be satisfied with. If we expect to make our nation safer, we must apply these findings to our policies. We can have all the knowledge and research in the world, but nothing will improve if we cannot use them to make a difference. As German writer Johann Wolfgang von Goethe once said, knowing is not enough, we must apply. Willing is not enough, we must do. People from every viewpoint will find it easier to come together if we have all of the proper and up-to-date information. When we stop focusing on only a few events and think critically about the pieces and the big picture they create, perhaps one day we can go from this to this to this, maybe even to this. Thank you.